Good morning. This is Daniel with Park Talks. Park it, and let's talk about it. Today, I got a pretty interesting topic that we picked up. Grow up. Growing up. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. That scripture self-explains it completely every step. I was a child, past tense, spoke like a child, spoke like a child, past tense, thought like a child, past tense, reasoned like a child, past tense. When I became a man, current time, I gave up childish ways. Would you say that that's a different person than what it used to be? Yes, I would. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. And behold, a new has come. That's 2 Corinthians 5.17. A new has come. You're not the same old person anymore. There should become fruit on the vine to show this. We've talked about planting the garden quite frequently. And how you plant corn, you grow corn. You plant tomatoes, you grow tomatoes. And the deeper the roots go, the harder it is to stop that growth. This last year, we've expressed a lot about that with the garden I finally got to grow. That was, uh, that was a great experience. I'm looking forward to next year. Now, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who need, has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Okay? So we was a child. We spoke like a child. We thought like a child. We reasoned like a child. We became a man. We grew up. Now we're a new person. We are in Christ. Now we're just, we're in 2 Corinthians. We're in Christ. So there should be some things change. Now in Christ, Christ is in you. Holy Spirit is now living in you. Acts 2.38 tells us that once we repent and we're baptized and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit comes and lives with us. And this promise in Acts 39 uh, 239 tells it goes on to say how it is for everybody as far as the Lord our God shall call. All right. When you look at a life of someone who confesses a relationship to Christ or with God through Jesus Christ, there are characteristics that you will see in things of the old that fade away. Something like a child, as they grow, they develop. There's many things as a child that they need, and as they get old, they don't need anymore. You know, their crib, the toys, the way they used to talk the way we talked to them as their elder, uh, the diapers, the little outfits, there's so much. They just don't need them any longer. It's not that they were inherently bad. It's just in the seasons of the life that they have moved and grown into, they just don't need them any longer. In a Christian life, you'll see changes in the home environment. You'll see changes in the way that they treat their body, the way that they treat their spouse, the way that they treat their kids. Uh, I heard a pastor say one time, even the dog will eventually come to realize that, you know, the person's born again and has a, a different, there's a difference in that individual. Now, will the person still get frustrated and angry and ticked off? And yeah, yeah, it, it could happen. It can. Jesus exhibited anger when needed, when it was appropriate, and then let it go when it was needed, immediately. Now, when, like when you grew up, from a little kid, from a, from a baby or an infant, as time progressed, uh, it, like your life in Christ, it'll progress the same way. We'll look at some simple areas where you'll start to see changes and things that you'll move away from and things that you won't want to do, things that you just won't do, um, like murder, <laughs> okay? Seriously, why would a person who professes a life with Christ, a relationship with Christ, Jesus Christ, and they plan to have a future in heaven, Okay. Why would they murder? Why would they lie? Just seeding the uh, future on this one. When a person has a relationship, there will be things that are evident. And some ways of the old person that are just going to be, they may be moved to the future and they may be completely moved out of their way. List of characteristics that I have found going through the scripture and recognizing in people who profess, this may not be an entire list, this is just what I've located, paralleling to the scripture. Here's things you'll see. This person, you'll see it. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I know, you probably know where that came from. There's also, they're going to rejoice in truth. They're going to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. They also have faith. You know another thing? They're also going to have no other gods before the one God of creation. They're not going to carve up any graven images, any idols. The Lord's name won't come out of their mouth in vain. I don't care how you twist it or concoct it. If they're using God's name, it's in a prayer or reverent manner. Not a curse word, not a slang, not a slanderous point. Not telling God to damn this and God damn that. Okay? These people will actually remember the Sabbath day and they will keep it holy. They will honor their father and their mother. Now, it's so interesting when you look at this, you go, oh, okay, well, you just told us what love is. You just told us what uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit are. You just told us the Ten Commandments. But what if they're not Ten Commandments? What if they're specific things that will not show up in the life of a believer? Or maybe they don't have a relationship with Christ. See, the worldly ways, the world has their ways too, okay? They envy, they boast, they're arrogant, rude. They insist on their own way. They're irritable, resentful, irritable. Yeah, touch them and see how long it takes them to explode all over you. Well, and they're resentful? Well, yeah, they got that and I didn't get it. They got the same thing I got. I want more, more. That's greed, all right? They also don't rejoice about wrongdoing. You'll find a person with a relationship with Christ who's grown up past the worldly ways. So commit murder. We talked about that. They're not going to be committing adultery, stealing, bearing false witness against their neighbor, lying. That's not an entire list. That's just a few that I found. And these exactly parallel the scripture. If a person has a relationship with God, okay, Jesus Christ had a relationship with God. Yes, the relationship was he was God in the flesh. How many of those things did he do? Peter, he was a man of God, but he lied. But he paid for it, too. These ways of your past life will become nothing you choose for your future. We'll shed them as we grow up. Because, we, like I said, we just will not need them any longer. Now, we talk about shedding things about who we are, things that we've seen all our entire life, the ways we've been raised. We're told to deny self, okay? It doesn't make sense. How are we going to get this done in our own flesh? You're not. If you're doing this in your own flesh, you're not. It won't work. It won't happen. It won't be successful. It can't be. Because everything that we listed is against what the flesh wants, does, and sees. I even know many, many people who go to church on a regular basis who couldn't get through 20% of the list I just read before they're going, yep, I do that and that. And well, I don't steal, I don't murder, I don't lie, but I don't respect my parents. Man, I boast all the time. I'm very arrogant. Oh my goodness, I'm irritable. Let somebody get in my way in traffic. I'm always gonna get my way. I'm very resentful. Punching somebody in the eye, no problem. I don't believe anything anybody says. I'd rather kick the dog than pet the dog. I'm not a faithful person or good. I go to church on Sunday. I don't have any little idols sitting around. I try to love people. My life isn't peaceful. I act like I got joy. I've seen that in the pews. I've seen that in the pulpit. Look at the fruit. If I'm looking at tomatoes hanging off the green vinery thing, pretty good bet that that's a tomato vine. Pretty good bet that started with a tomato seed. So Jesus gives us a seed. He talks about the seed in John 14, 25. I'm sorry, 26. And in 14, 26 and 27, he talks about John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Okay, the Helper, also known as Counselor, Advocate, Guide, Comforter, teacher well if he's all that a helper you know counselor advocate guide teacher all of that oh uh, how come every time i got questions and i you know god i want the answers god i want the answers i don't get the answers i forget who it was i heard say this and i really like it have you ever been in the middle of a test and the teacher 
answer your questions for you. No, no. Matter of fact, the teacher remains silent. When you go into a courtroom, attorneys refer to each other and the judges refer to the attorneys in a certain word on a regular basis. Not attorney. They call them counselor. They're also called advocates. That'd be the Greek where the word used the helper uh, it translates to all of those. Okay, let's move on to 27. Peace I leave with you. Okay, now he's going to, remember, in the, in the last part of 26, Jesus says, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Here's what he's going to say. Peace I, I leave with you. My peace I give you. Really? Yeah, yeah. Jesus goes on to say, Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Okay? Peace. Really? Why is my life all chaotic? I can give you a $100 bill. You can put it in your billfold. You can still walk around hungry. You don't even need to acknowledge that you have that $100 bill in your billfold, that you now have possession of. That is your money. Let not your heart be troubled. Oh, Lord, what am I going to do? Neither let them be afraid. Hmm. Now he's going to remind you of these things because he promised you these. Peace in your thoughts, peace in your life, peace in your career, peace in your home, peace in your relationships. If you turn towards peace, you don't have to. You can turn towards contention. Okay, so as we're growing up, we're not going to lose everything in our life, but maybe some things will grow up with us. They'll flip. Here's what might happen. I got a list of 15. Again, non-inclusive. Not in no particular order. It looks to look at this. Opinions become truths. Assumptions become facts. Fear becomes hope. Depression becomes joy. Lust becomes respect of others. Greed becomes enough. Pride becomes humility. Worry becomes planning for the future. Stress becomes management. Anxiety becomes drive. Complaining becomes complimenting. Harsh words become inspiration. Cursings become blessings. An out-of-control lifestyle, self-control. Drunkenness becomes sobriety and clear thoughts. This is what the Holy Spirit brings to your life. Now, everything we've listed begins in, works in, and cannot ever happen outside of your own thoughts first first you don't have to live that type of a lifestyle you can live the lifestyle you choose Jesus does give or God does give us the ability of free will we decide we want to live like our hair is on fire and going to hell tomorrow well sucks for you but you can okay John 14 chapter or verse 30 I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. Oh, that's not God? No, 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 no. Now when Jesus says, he has no claim on me, the ruler of this world is the evil one, the enemy, the negative. So when that, first, that entity appears, that entity drives your thoughts and feeds your thoughts. That entity tells you you're not good enough. That entity brings confusion, contention, complaining. If that entity becomes envious, prideful, greedy, that entity is where Jesus is talking about. He says, I will not be with you much longer, for the ruler of this world is coming. He wasn't, Jesus wasn't running off. He was going back to where he needed to and then sending a counselor. We've got the counselor. He didn't leave us alone, nor will he ever. Now that gives me peace. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. In Psalms 15, 2, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his hum, tongue, who does not evil do evil to his neighbor, nor take up reproach against his friend. In Psalms 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. 
who else's sight matters. Who is with you all the time. Yes, you want your word, the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart also to be acceptable in the eyes of your spouse. But if it's acceptable in the eyes of the Lord, it will be acceptable in the eyes of your spouse. Don't accuse your spouse of things they've never done. Don't accuse your spouse of things that somebody else has done to you. In closing prayer, I offer this few, a few things here. Okay, Psalms 26.2 Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. What will happen if God actually does that to you? Pray that prayer if you're ready for him to. Because after that, we go, we slide down to Psalms 51.10. Because when you test my heart and my mind, we're saying, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. When you do that, the fruit that comes out is very noticeable. People don't need to ask, are you a Christian? They know. Do you have a relationship with God? They know. There's no doubt in your every step. Go over the fruits that are listed in Galatians 5, 22 through 25. See how the characteristics of a spirit-filled life are perhaps the greatest proof of genuine faith. If you see these characteristics, then this part, these people do have the genuine faith. Here's another question. How might we better appreciate and understand the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Do you have the, the power of the, Holy, of, of the Holy Spirit living inside of you? A little thing I gleaned from a book I was reading. It's called The Be No Do Thought. And here's how it unfolds to me in this. Be forgiven. You were living in sin, and you are away from God. No, all things are anew. You are born again. You have a new way to think. And do. Live this life as if you are a temple for the Holy Spirit, and enjoy growing up. It's the way your it was designed to be. Not rules, principles. There's an interesting question I've asked before. I'd like you to reconsider. Are we a body with a consciousness? Are we a consciousness with a body? Or are we a temple with a consciousness and the Spirit of God living inside? We are a three in one. As we grow, we will live this out. And we'll live out Matthew 5.16. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they see, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Are you a Sunday morning Christian? If you even go to church anymore? We have so many opinions out there right now, even in the church. The lines have slurred and blurred between the church and the world. The difference is one group goes in on Sunday and the other group don't. One group might have a midweek get-together, and the other group, well, they might get together at the bar or wherever they may congregate mine was the bar years ago because I didn't care if that light showed I didn't care people didn't care about me why would I care about them I grew up now I care I caught myself just the other day picking a couple of bugs off the screen where I normally knock them on the floor and smush them and send them outside I don't have the right to take that bug's life This is Daniel with Park Talks. Thanks for joining us this week. And be blessed.